prayer Wednesday Bible study, amen? Sunday morning service, of course. And, you know, if we want to see the atmosphere broken, you've got to, you've got to, got to, got to pray. Amen? I believe that if you want to see change in your life, you've got to pray. And I believe if you want to see change in your life, you've got to act. And, uh, and if you want to see change in your life, you've got to take the authority around you. Let me tell you something. You'll never see, or God will never use you across the, the waters on the mission field unless you can take care of demons right here. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, everybody settled now? Good. Uh, let me ask you a question. Where were you at 4 a.m. this morning? Hey, sleeping, snoring away. Um, and you woke up. You went on your day. Well, at 4 o'clock this morning, I got a, an alert from the fire department that there was a major structure fire in Fairhaven. And so I'm going to just ask um, Pastor to put some of these slides up so you can see where I was at 4 a.m. This is the Livesley Club in Fairhaven. It's a community outreach. They are very, very big in community as far as soccer, baseball, all those things. They sponsor a lot of those things. Next one. Just, this, is, this is what uh, was there when they arrived. Um, it was really a, a fast-moving fire, and it really engulfed the entire building. Next one, please. Uh, that's when I got there, and uh, about uh, maybe a half an hour after I was there. Next one, please. Uh, the entire building is lost. It's gone. Next one, please. They put tons of water on that structure. Because it was old, it just kept burning and burning and burning. Next one, please. I think I got, what, two more? One more? And that's the uh, one pot, but the other pot was also on fire because it was like a, like a T. So this was the t top of the T, and it went down that way. And so that's where I was at 4 a.m. this morning, and uh, I, I didn't expect that. I was, I was in bed, and I was kind of tossing and turning a little bit, and I knew Linda was up because she had her earphones in. And uh, when she puts her music on or whatever she's listening to, the, the, the little iPod lights up like, uh, you know, like uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It just lights the entire room up, you know, and, and you, uh, we want to welcome those by Facebook. God bless you, by the way. And, um, and uh, so I was awake, and then my, I, I always turn my phone uh, on to vibrate, but last night I forgot and I didn't. And so when, it, when mine goes, it goes, and so I, I noticed I had an alarm, so I looked at it, and it was, so I called in, and I have a code that I punch in, and it, and it tells me where the fire is. And I said, I'll wait, and I'll, I'll wait and see what happens, but as I listened to it on the radio, on the uh, fire radio, um, the chief said, you know, bring in Mattapoisa and um, Marion to cover our station uh, and send a Kushnet here. And I knew that was big. And so I said, I better go. But what I want to share with you today is about being prepared. Now, I want to tell you, I wasn't prepared this morning. I was, I was like, you know, sandy-eyed. You know, I, I got up and, you know, and I, I, I got the call. And, and so I got up and I looked for my pants and I, I couldn't find my pants. And so I ran into the closet, got my, um, my uh, tech pants. They call them tech pants. I, I wore them. And... And then I, I went out of the room. I, I, got my, I couldn't find my shirt. And then I was looking for my shirt. And I found my shirt. And I put my shirt on. And, and then I went outside the room. And I closed the door. And then I realized I didn't have any socks on. And then I went back in the room and put my socks on. And then I ran outside the room again. And I was going down the stairs. And I looked. And I didn't have my belt on. So I had to run back again and go put my belt on. So this happened about two or three times. And then I finally went downstairs, and I forgot my boots. So I had to come back upstairs and get my boots. And I had to go back downstairs and put my boots on. What I want to talk to you about is being prepared. And <laughs> what that taught me this morning was is that I've got to make sure that every night before I go to bed that I know exactly where everything is in case this ever happens again. Okay? Because... 
I, I can't be running around like a chicken. You know, you, you have to see me. I was like, walking all over. Oh, my belt. I got to get my belt. Oh, where's, where's my socks? Oh, I got to go back and get my socks. I was all over the place. I should have everything right there ready for when that situation happens. When war was declared between France and Germany, Count von Moltke, the strategist, was fully prepared for it. And the news was brought to him late one night when he had already gone to bed. And when he received that, he said, very well, to the messenger, he said, the third portfolio on the left, and then he went back to sleep. What does that mean? That means he had already prepared for an attack. He had already, already had portfolios for situations that were going to come if this was to happen or if that was to happen or if this was to happen. And so he was prepared. Now, you and I, we prepare. When we get married, if, if you have children, you prepare. Well, some of you do for their education. You um, invest, and you take uh, money and put it aside and save for their education so that when the time comes 20 years later and they're in college or 18 years later and they're in college, you have money put aside. Or you, you have timed it for your retirement where you know your 401k will cover some of the costs. Or you pay off your mortgage and you know that your mortgage is paid off, so if you need money for college, you can always borrow against your house and you can pay the college. When you drive your automobile, you prepare by having insurance. And you take out insurance just in case something happens. When you go to work somewhere, you make sure that you have health care coverage. You make sure that you're covered in case... Say it with me. Something happens. And when you buy a house and you have a home, you have house insurance. And that house insurance is in case if something happens. So we prepare in all kinds of different ways. In situations and circumstances in our life. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to the book of Luke with me. I'm going to be reading from verse 37 to verse 39, chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 37 to verse 40. And while we're turning there, does anyone have a testimony? Anybody have a testimony? And before we leave tonight, uh, this, this morning, I'm going to pray for Vicki as she's going in for a slight uh, operation, surgery, tomorrow morning. We want to pray for her, so we'll do that right after the service. We're going to have you come up. So uh, if something happens where the pastor gets caught up in the spirit or something, just remind me so I don't forget, because that's very important. We want to do that. Okay, starting with verse 37. Thank you. Say this first word with, with me, please. Blessed. Blessed. God wants you to be blessed. You know, so many people think that God is, you know, very mean. And he, he enjoys it when you suffer and go through things. No, he doesn't. God wants you to be blessed. He said, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find him sleeping. It, it doesn't say sleeping. He said, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. That's an action word. Not past tense. Watched, not future tense, will watch, but present tense, watching. 
You're watching. You're paying attention. What are you watching and paying attention to? What are we watching? What are we, what are we preparing for? But the coming of the Lord. But this word, watching, The Lord says, you're blessed if you're watching. Active. Is that watching soap operas? Movies? Football? Baseball? Basketball? Television? What are you watching? He told Peter, watch and pray, lest your faith would fail you. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Because there are certain signs that God says is going to happen. Certain things that are going to take place. Hallelujah. That will give you a clue. How many ever played that game, Clue? You ever played that game? That's fun. Right, you try to figure out who did it. You get all these clues, and you, you, you mastermind them and put them together and try to think about who was the one that did it. But God didn't leave us clueless. He gave us signs and wonders, and he says, when you see these things begin to take place, he said, look up, for your redemption is drawing nigh. There is no time in history, listen to what I'm saying to you this morning, there's no time in history ever than when we have been closer to the coming of the Lord. There were certain aspects of prophecy that needed to be fulfilled. Number one, Israel had to become a nation. That happened in 1960, uh, 1948 when, when Israel became a nation. Because it had to fulfill the prophecies that, and listen, these prophecies were hundreds and hundreds of years before. So these, these people didn't know this in the natural. And they prophesied the end times, what would take place when Israel would gather their people from all the nations and would be gathered unto Israel. One of the major prophecies that have just come to pass, and it's in your lifetime, and it happened just maybe six months or five months ago, whatever it was, is when President Donald Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel. That's a major, 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 major prophetic fulfillment. I don't know if you know this. We're talking about prepared, being prepared, preparing Israel today. This is all factual information. It's not hearsay. I'm not making it up. You can go in online and you can read it for yourself that Israel has already begun to prepare for the building of the third temple. So that the prophecy that Jesus spoke, the abomination of desolation, can take place. Now, in order for the temple to be rebuilt, listen to this now. In order for the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, before the temple was ever dedicated or even built, they had to first have a red heifer to sacrifice. Do you know that Israel's already been doing this for years and now they have a red heifer ready? They have the utensils ready. They have the priestly garments ready. Well, why are they doing that? It's because they are preparing for the rebuilding of that temple. 
Now, this is historical. Now, there's been a lot of talk lately of where the temple should be, and many people believe where the Golden Dome is. That's the place that the temple should be built. But I'm having second thoughts on that because of the archaeological discoveries and the discoveries that from Bible scholars, not just Jewish, but Bible scholars, are examining and they're seeing, they're saying they believe the temple was a, Herod's temple and also Solomon's temple was built in the city of David, which is a little further uh, away from that. Not far, about, about uh, 600 feet. So there's nothing that prevents that third temple from being built. Nothing, except God's timing. But what I'm trying to say to you is, is that they are preparing. They are watching. They are waiting for their Messiah. Because they believe that when they build the temple, that the Messiah will come back. And so they're preparing. Now, this has been going on for years, even though we've been maybe not talking about it and maybe aware of it. But all these things have been taking place behind the scenes. And they're getting ready for that third temple. That's, that's, that's undenied. You can't, that's, it's there. It's a fact. He says, Whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to me and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, he wants you to know this, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and have, would not have suffered his house to be broken in through. In verse 40, that's my text this morning. Be ye, all of you, including me, therefore, ready. Be ready. Be ready doing what? Watching. What are we to watch for? The signs. What would it be some of the signs? Jesus said, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Kingdoms shall rise against kingdom, nation against nation. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life that we've not been at war. Back in the 60s, we had the Vietnam, uh, before that we had the Korean War, then we had the Vietnam War. That lasted a while, and then we were helping this nation, helping that nation. We were at war, helping them. And, and then we were in the Iraqi war. Now we're in a Syrian war. And we're almost in a Korean war, again, North Korea. So there shall be pestilence, sickness, diseases, epidemics. We see that. Go back into the 1900s and search epidemics, and you'll see the bubonic plague, the black plague, all of these that killed millions of people. See, we, we, we don't think about that. Killed millions of people. And there'd be famines. There should be famines. You know how many people die every single day from lack of food around the world? Children, adults, from malnutrition. All of these signs, Jesus said, watch. And then he said this. He said, there's coming a time when men will kill you and think they're doing God's service. Do you see the Muslim extremists? The terrorists? We just saw on television, we saw it on YouTube, the beheading of Christians. Did you ever think you'd see that again in time? Beheading of Christians for their faith? He said, 
They're thinking they're doing God a favor. They read the Quran and they read where it says that if they will not convert to Islam, their infidels kill them. And it's happening not 40 years ago. I'm talking about in the open. Not 30 years ago, not 20 years ago, not 10 years ago, but now in our lifetime. It's happening. Jesus also said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Lord. God gave a specific scripture or time frame of what was going on. Now, I want to say this. Is Jesus a liar? Well, if he's a liar, then he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he cannot be our savior. So if Jesus is not a liar and he used the Old Testament account of Noah. And he said, as it was in that day, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What was going on in Noah's day? They were eating. They were drinking. We have more drinking and eating establishes in the world today. In the United States today, it's, it's, it's unparalleled. You, sometimes we don't even know where to go or what to eat. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and given in marriage. That means they were given in marriage. They were divorcing. They were remarrying. They were divorcing. They were remarrying. This is the time of history where there's the most divorce going on in our nation. Four out of five marriages fail. You don't think that's a sign? But then he went on specifically to give a real, 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 real eye-opener. He said, as it was in the days of Lot... So you mean to tell me Jesus was quoting the Old Testament of when Lot was in Sodom. And God sent the angels and told Lot, get out, because I'm going to destroy that city because of its homosexuality. Now you have to deny, you have to deny history. Because let me tell you, I've been to Israel and I've seen Sodom. It's all salt. What happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? She turned to a pillar of... He said, as it was in those days, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. What were they doing in those days? Homosexuality was accepted by the community. Blessed are those servants when the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Are you watching? They're accepting same-sex marriage. Transvestites. All of those things. There's nothing new under the sun. And yet, we still don't believe. I was talking to somebody on Facebook about this. And I noticed that they were hurt. And I just gave them something. And they, they wrote back and said, well, I used to be a Christian. And I was with a girl. And she was helping me along. And then, you know, I married her. And then she didn't want me anymore. And we divorced. And so I, I fell away. I knew there was something why he fell away. But I told him, I said, God still loves you. God can still restore you. Blessed are ye. Be, for the, there, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. 
You know, the Bible even talks about skeptics. I believe it was Paul he wrote, he says, there's coming a time when men will say, oh, where's the, where's the coming of the Lord? Where? I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's there. You can read it. Oh, when's the coming of the Lord? You've been saying that for a long time. People have been saying that for generations. He even said it then in the Bible. Thousands of years ago, he says, there's going to come a time people will say that. But the, but the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he's merciful because he wants more to come in. Be therefore ready also. You know what that word ready means? Anybody have an idea what the word ready means? Yes. Did you cheat? Is it in your Bible? Oh. It's be prepared. Be prepared. Don't be caught like pastor this morning looking for his pants. Looking for his belt. Looking for the shoes. Looking for the socks. Running all over like a chicken. Don't be unprepared. I'm telling you, that taught me a lesson this morning. From now on, I'm having my pants, my fire pants, everything that I need to go to that to go on an emergency. I'm going to have it already packed and ready on the side. So when I get up, all I have to do is go to that room, my closet. I have an eight by ten closet. Go in there, get dressed, and I can leave. That taught me about being prepared. Be ye therefore also ready. Let me ask you a question. Honestly now, are you ready? Have you been watching? Have you been discerning the time that we live in? Have you been preparing your heart for the coming of the Lord? Have you prepared yourself to say, Lord, examine me to see if there's anything in me that I need to change. God, help me to change. Help me to believe. Help me to be able to live the life that you want me to live. Because, God, you would know all the answers. Wouldn't that be neat to take him to school with you? When you have a test, he knows all the answers. But God won't give you all the answers unless you apply it. See, the Holy Spirit can only bring back to your remembrance what you put in. When you put the word in you, get the word inside of you. You can only reap what you sow. Let's look at Psalm 130, verse 6 for a moment. She's going to be a singer like Grandma. Like mama. My soul. Look at this. My soul what? Wait. Now I know. How many of you ever had to wait for a bus? Huh? How many of you ever have to wait for somebody to pick you up? And how, how many times have you been told that you were going to get picked up at a certain time and you weren't. What ends up happening? You be getting frustrated. You be getting aggravated. You be start getting uh, restless, annoyed. Right? Why? Because that person's not on time. Now, God says, I'm coming. Jesus said, I'm coming. And when he doesn't come, when we think he should come, we get annoyed, frustrated, aggravated. Well, Lord, take me out of here. I'm, I'm ready to go, Lord. Take me. I'm out of here. And the Lord will ask you the question for us. Why? Why do you want me to take you? Well, Lord, you know all these bills I got. And he'd say, well, I'm not taking you out because you got bills due. First of all, find out why you have bills in the first place. 
Hello? He says, my soul waiteth for the Lord. What's the one element that is in waiting? She said, patience, okay. Tolerance. What you, did you say something, Deb? That's right. Time. Time. My soul waiteth for the Lord. More than they that watch for the morning. Are you waiting for the Lord? Are you preparing? It's going to be a sad day. See, everybody thinks the Lord's coming is going to be a good day. No, the Bible says it's going to be a day of dark clouds and gloom. It's going to be a good day for the Christian, but not for the one that was left behind. Hello? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know what it's going to cost you if you stay behind? You can't say one little simple prayer and think you're going. You're in a delusion. My Bible tells me they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. If you stop enduring, guess what? Do you understand what you're going to go through if you're left behind? Because you haven't watched. And he said if you had known what time the thief was coming, you would have... Prepared for that, right? And I know this for a fact. Jesse, if you knew someone was going to come and steal your money that you earned and saved up and birthday money, and you knew someone was going to come and steal it at a certain time, would you go to work? No, you'd stay home, right? You'd protect that, right? And then you tell your mother on your, your sister, no, I'm looking. If you knew, understand what I'm saying. If you knew the exact time that the Lord was coming. Let's say, I'm just going to say for the sake of argument. Now, I know it wouldn't happen because the Bible says it wouldn't happen. But let's say God gave you a dream and you knew exactly the time up to the second that Jesus was coming. Would you live differently than you live now? You would? How many would? Raise your hands. Be honest now. Come on. Would you live differently? If you knew the exact time and day and second that the Lord was coming, would you live differently? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. I'll tell you why. You know what you would do? You'd live the way you want to about five minutes before. Come on now. That's the human nature does that. We knew the day and the time and the hour and the second. We, oh, okay, so I can do all this stuff I want to do until five minutes before. Unless when you didn't expect it, God said, change of plans. My soul waits for the Lord more than that they that watch for the morning. Sometimes life gets so busy. We get caught up in work and shopping, and food shopping, and busy. So God has watchmen. Say with me, watchmen. God has watchmen. Israel had a watchman they would set out on the tower in the walls of Jerusalem, of Israel. 
And they were watchmen so that and they could see when the enemy was approaching and they would blow the horn. You know, the shofar? They would blow the horn and warn the people. God has called men of God to be watchmen. God has called pastors to be watchmen. Some people get so mad at me sometimes. And I don't mean to get people mad at me. I don't want you mad at me. I love you. I love people. I'll do anything for people. My wife will tell you that. One of the things my wife compliment my wife gives me, she says, you know what? You're the kindest person I ever met. Melted my heart. And I said, you know, I wish you were a little more kind. <laughs> kind of rub off a little bit. <laughs> See, Linda's the type of black and white person. If you have any dealings with Linda, if anybody had any dealings with Linda, you'll find out. She'll tell you the truth, and she's black or white. That's it. No gray. I kind of work with people, you know, work a little bit with people. I'm a little long-suffering and stuff. Until they begin to manipulate me. When they begin to manipulate me, watch out. When God calls watchmen, I want to read something to you. Ezekiel 3.17. I'm almost finished. How many would love it if we only had 20-minute sermon? Would you like that? Raise your hand. A sermonette? You like a little sermonette? What do you want? drive through sermon? Wow. Wow. See me after service. <laughs> wow. Do you know they have them? You're, you're, you're laughing, but they do have churches like that. I'm serious. You drive up to the window. You pay your tithe. They give you a, like a two-minute, five-minute word, and then you go off. They give you a little song, and you sing a praise worship, and then you go off. And that's how they, they have several, several uh, lanes. That's what they do. It's, fast, it's called fast service church. Look at Ezekiel 3.17. Son of man. He's talking to Ezekiel. He says, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. Hello? And give them warning from you. Is that what it says? No, it says from me. God speaking to Ezekiel. He says, son of man, I made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Can you put that in NLT for me? Son of man, I have appointed you. As a watchman for Israel, whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. Why? Why immediately? Because you may not have time later. Warn them immediately. Now, wouldn't that be lovely if people would listen? Come on now. Wouldn't that be great if people would listen? Oh, I, I hear you, Pastor. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. When you hear, when you listen, you're doing something. What are you doing? You're processing. Ever talk to somebody and you're talking to them and then they answer you and they, it has nothing to do with the thing you even asked? you understand what the reason was? Because they were not listening. I once uh, was, I, we were talking about statistics, and I was talking to a person. I said, you know that w men talk less than women? In fact, women talk about 35,000. Well, this was back then. I mean, they may talk more now. I don't know. <laughs> but back then, I said, women talk 35,000 words a day, 
and men only 22,000 words a day. And this lady spoke up and she said, do you know why that is? And I said, no. And she said, that's because we have to tell you twice. <laughs> Son of man, I, I've appointed you. Do you understand that this calling as a pastor is not a self-appointment? Now, I'm sure there's people that call themselves in the ministry. But anyone, listen to me, anyone in their right minds would never choose to be a pastor. One minute you're loved, one minute you're hated. One minute people are talking about you and talking how great you are, and the next thing you know, they're, stone them, stone them. <laughs> Crucify him. <coughs> you're the greatest thing since sliced bread until you do one thing they don't like, and then they leave the church. And so you, as a good shepherd, you know, you leave the 99 and you go after the one. You know, I have a pastor friend of mine. I won't tell you who he is, but he just had three couples leave his church. And he's heartbroken because, you know, they were young couples. And, and the thing they came out with, oh, it's not you. And what is it then? Was it because he preached a message about modesty and not for you you ladies to come in half naked in church now let me tell you something if you've been with the Lord for a long time and you come in here half naked I'm going to tell you about it come on but nothing breaks our pastor's heart more than to hear people say, I'm not going to church. I don't want to be in church. Come on. Well, you know what? That's true. I don't want to be in church either. If I'm not growing, you know what I'm saying? A watchman appointed for Israel or the church to give you warning what? Immediately. Anyone used to watch Lost in Space? Remember the robot? When something would come and it was, you know, something was going to, bad was going to happen, what did he do? Danger, danger, warning, warning, danger, danger, warning, warning, danger. Remember? But we're living in a time. And I, and I talk to pastors all the time, and, you know, they're compromising more and more. One of the areas they compromise in, and I don't care what they say, is they believe that women can be pastors. And I ask them, prove it to me biblically, doctrinally, and they cannot do that. They just use emotion, and they use, but look at how gifted they are. You don't judge truth by how gifted somebody is. The word says no. That's no derogatory uh, assignment on women. Women are beautiful. Women have a beautiful place that God created as a help me. But never, never God intended it to be as a pastor. Let me ask you a question. The Bible says that which is spiritual than that which is natural first than that which is spiritual. Why, are you, why I say this to women may be watching me that hate me right now, but that's okay. My question to you is why doesn't your husband take your last name? Huh? How come I'm not Mr. Eve? Come on, somebody, answer the question. Why aren't you Mrs. and Mr.? How come? 
Oh, I can tell I'm going to get some feedback on Facebook on this one. Why aren't you Mrs. and Mr. Menser? Why aren't we Mrs. and Mr. Damus? Come on. It's because God is a God of divine order. He created man first, not because he was a, he was a, a male chauvinist, but he created the man first. And then he created the woman. Because I believe that if he created the woman first, she would have told God how to do everything. <laughs> but, there's <laughs> but there's coming a time. Listen to me now. Jeremiah 6.17. Yes, 6.17. There's coming a time. Listen to me now. This is very careful. Jeremiah 6, 17. He says, I posted. Don't, did I give you that right one? Yeah, I did. Okay. He said, I posted what? Watchmen over you who said, listen for the sound of the alarm. But you replied what? No, we won't pay attention. Is that you? Is that you? I don't want to. Is that you? I don't want to. Is that you? I posted watchmen over you who said, listen for the sound of the alarm. Well, you replied, no, we won't pay attention. We're not going to pay attention. Really? I was reading a book by Jeremiah Burroughs from the 15th and 16th century, uh, 1500 and 1600 century. And... Um, it's called Godly Worship. There's some places that have the book in print. Some of it don't. Some of them don't. It's, it's, it's out of print. But you can get it for about $25. I, I really believe you should get that book if you want to know about worship. And in that book, he said something on this effect. I can't remember the exact words, but I'll paraphrase for you. It says, if you continuously hear God's word and you do not pay attention to it, or do it, you are worse than the demons that hear it. Because see, he says you're deceived in, in thinking that you're going to be in a place that you're not going to be. Hello? Now see, if this place this morning would have had fire alarms inside the building, smoke detectors inside the building, but because it was an old building, it was grandfathered in that they didn't have to have it. But if they would have had smoke alarms in there and no smoke alarms would have gone off and they would have gave, uh, you know, would have gave attention to the fire department, they could have got there sooner and probably could have probably saved some of the building. Can I tell you this morning, I'm giving you a fire alarm. And I'm letting you know right now we are closer to the Lord's coming than any other time in history. Will you be the kind of person that will listen to the watchmen? Or will you be one of these that say, no, we will not pay attention? You know why? Because it's easier just to go your own way. Or will you pay attention? 
So I've set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. My question this morning is, are you ready? What if Jesus was to come, and this microphone dropped right out of my hand, and up we went? Would you go? How many know that you are going to heaven? How many of you know? You, I mean, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're going to heaven. The Bible says these things were written that you may know you have eternal life. Where are you building your house? On the rock or on the sand? They that built the house on the rock, when the winds came and it all, you know, blew against the house, the house stood. But if you build it on the sand, and then he explains, and he says, those that build the house upon the rock are those who, when they hear the word of God, they what? They do it. And those that build their house upon the sand are those when they hear of the word of God and they what? Don't do it. Now, I remember years ago, Auntie Edith's husband, Romy, they bought a cottage down in Mattapoisa. It was, what was the? Angelica Point. And every once a year, they would have a, a, a cookout, and we would go there, and we'd have all the family together. And I remember one year, my uncle decided he was going to put sliding glass doors in, and he was going to fix it all up a little bit more, and he, he fixed it all up. And I think it was two years later, around one year, two years later. Was it Hurricane Bob, was it? Go figure, right, Hurricane Bob? <laughs> Hurricane Bob came in and tore that thing right off the foundation. And how devastating that was. Many of the homes there were, were, were destroyed. But it was unexpected. There was nothing that could be done. It was too late. I mean, gone, wiped out, gone. I don't even think they found the building, did they? Just a roof. Wow. Son, I don't care if you get killed. You go get my books. <laughs> wow. Well, believe me, I would have gave him a warning and told him, no, don't go get those books. <laughs> but they said we will not hock him. I'm going to ask Bob to play a little music for me, please. Jesus said these words. They that receive me receive life. And they that do not receive me do not have life. But a certain judgment waiting for them. Those are not scare tactics. Those are truths. This morning I was so discombobulated. You had to see, I was laughing at myself. I was like, come on, are you?